we've all heard about human trafficking and and think about oh that's what happens over there certainly not in my city or in other nations or other international people who are coming into the united states maybe they're being human trafficked but but what i found on south robinson is that women and children are being bought and sold so on south robinson in that that location known as the $20 street, I was introduced to pimps, those who are the sellers of the women for commercial sex, the, the human traffickers. And I was also introduced to the buyers, who we refer to as Johns, the men who would purchase women and children for commercial sex in, in our city. So, you know, No Boundaries has become really well known for fight and the fight of human trafficking. And we've come to know so many girls, preteens and teenagers and adults that have been caught up in the world of trafficking. But the common denominator, it seems to be with so many of the girls is that um, they have a, many of them come from a, a really difficult background of abuse, of violence, uh, maybe drug use, uh, where it's a, a family and a generational thing. But, uh, and all that leads to having, for them having a low self-esteem where they have no idea who they are. And so they end up looking for love. And so they're looking to um, for, for the man to fulfill that. And they end up uh, finding these men who, who uh, pretend to be their boyfriends and they get controlled by them. They get uh, tricked into, them, into situations they shouldn't be in. They get coerced or talked into selling themselves for sex. And then they're suddenly in this world of trafficking and they find themselves without hope, without any kind of options. They feel cornered and, and sort of in a hole where they, they can't see any way out. And so we hear these stories, so what are we gonna do about it? So in late 2011 is when we first started doing street outreach. Um, someone told us about Robinson and how it was relative to the work that we've done overseas. And so we just went out there and started building relationships with the women. We'd bring them little gifts, um, just ask them what their name was, how we could pray for them. And then as we started to build more and more relationships with the women out there, uh, we started seeing that they weren't getting medical care, they didn't have their basic needs met. And so we felt like we could help them with that. So we started the Safe Friends program where we would take them to a doctor's appointment. We would take them uh, to do something fun like the movies. And then um, just really begin to show them how life can be different than the stuff that they knew about. About the abuse, about um, having to go work every day to make a living on the streets. How that God made them each individually different and he had a plan for their life. Um, that their friends weren't abusive, that their friends actually loved them. And um, being able to just speak life or speak light into the darkness of their life and to show them that the way that they live could be different. And so uh, as an organization, we've chosen to, to go out to where they are. We do street outreach, but no matter what the circumstances that are, our, our heart for them is just to, to love them and be Jesus to them. And so, like if we encountered a girl on the street, the conversation may be very simple and it's gonna be unusual in her, in her hearing where we say to them, what's your name? You're really beautiful and, and uh, I just wanna to get to know you better. And so building that trusting relationship and as we build that relationship, uh, our first goal is to meet their basic needs. And so it may be, the conversation may be, do you need some clothes? You look like you're cold out here. Do you, do you want to come to our community center and we have some free clothes for you? Or it may be they're hungry and so we have a free food pantry. We may able to, uh, be able to, uh, to feed them food and, and just be able to minister to them that way. And so our, our heart is just to love them and to be Jesus to them and help them on this journey out of trafficking and help them. It's, it's very, uh, can be a very cumbersome and complicated journey out of the trafficking world that they're in. But we wanna help them and we wanna hold their hands during that, that walking out of the journey. 
And I particularly think that this, this $20 street, South Robinson, is also the responsibility of the church. So, so think about this with me. Hatred cannot drive out hatred. Only love can. And so what happens when the body of Christ responds to the call to go, to get outside of their walls of comfort, to get outside of the four walls of the church and they go into an uncomfortable or an unfamiliar area? I've always loved a good story. And my favorites are the ones where the main characters um, suffer great hardship and always come out the hero. And until recently, I would always immediately categorize them in, as either a protagonist or an antagonist. Because that's how I saw the world. It was either black or white, and people were either good or bad because they were characters in my story. Because the bad ones did not deserve a story with a happy ending. Not in my book, anyway. Back in 2015, I met an antagonist um, in an NBI training video about perpetrators. I saw him on film um, right outside the community center um, at the firehouse, and he was trafficking women. His plot line uh, took a surprising twist during that time. It was where he um, realized that he needed a healing savior to help him get off the drugs and off the street. And so he asked um, my friends at NBI for some help. And that's kind of where I lost touch with him and his story. Because I was doing, going through a plot twist of my own. I realized I needed some help too. And so I asked my friends at NBI what to do. And it wasn't long before I discovered that he and I had a lot more in common than I thought. Though the settings were different, our early chapters of our childhoods were pretty much the same. We had suffered abuse and dysfunction, and as a result, um, the adult chapters of our lives were filled with anger and rage, and that was all intended to cover up a lot of shame and guilt over things we had no control of. But this is where the story gets good. <laughs> because these latest chapters have united us in friendship. I remember our very first conversation. It was at the firehouse, and I remember working up the nerve to go and introduce myself to him and just tell him who I was and that I had been praying for him. And I remember sitting beside him and neither one of us could look the other in the eye. And since that day, we've talked a lot. He comes into the firehouse and he asks for help for his friends, food for his friends. He'll bring in somebody from the street who needs help. These days, we can look each other in the eye. We can also laugh and smile. The conversations are easy. Now when we pray, we thank God for His healing and His grace. We also thank Him for our friends at NBI because they continue to teach us what it's like to love and to be loved. And they don't even know they're doing it. And after one heartfelt conversation with my friend, we shared secrets about our past and our hopes for the future. And I went home and I wrote a story. And I'd like to read something from the final paragraph. It seems appropriate that this story conclude with something profound, possibly an insightful remark about the flip sides of the same coin called abuse, how each side of the coin is desperately in need of the same healing savior, or maybe a personal sen sentiment about how hard my new friend and I are working to cast off our worldly labels of victimizer and victim so we can truly own our shared identity as children of God. However, this ending is not mine to write because the story was never mine to begin with, nor was my friend's his. We are both part of a much bigger story. It's a quirky adventure of mercy and grace written by a divine author who takes much liberty with the pen. Not only does his protagonist live, die, 
and live again, all for the sake of a cast of weak supporting characters. But he also edits and revises their escapades of sin and redemption many times over, and always comes out the hero. He then crafts an ending that is really no surprise, but amazing nonetheless. And it's that ending alone that makes it worth the read. How could this, this $20 street, Robinson, become a place of mercy and grace where those experiencing the most difficult, dangerous situations in our city have an encounter with the one true rescuer, and that's Jesus. And that's what we've encountered out on South Robinson.